Hume's law, aka you can't derive an ought from an is, is misleading and can be challenged as within an institution, such as playing chess with someone, one can take is statements which conceal pure facts, can derive imperative oughts and moral ones by simply noting that someone who doesn't play the game of chess specifically will not get anyone to play with them and they won't be playing chess if they invent more rules to it. Oughtness, much like the concept of meanness, is something we get through an analysis. Oughts can be derived from is by forms of reasoning in languages, and it's this view that makes no inroads with moral skepticism. Oughts also have many meanings. Epistemic oughts refer to the reasons one has for expecting an outcome, like how a guy ought to pay back money they owe. It's like a demand came about by the situation. Hypothetical oughts refers to like you ought to catch this train if you want to be on time. And an institution is like social practices that center around the making of promises, and that behavior that supports it underlines the notion that people are coherent persons through time. They will have rules or principles of actions, which people in it use to guide and enforce behavior on others, along with social expectations. Our notions come from speaking in context of an institution, and we create a natural error once you get out of that institution. Universalization can be brought up, and some of the issues with it. Universality is like when someone says that a certain action is morally right and wrong and ought to and ought not to be done, which sets themselves up to take the same view about similar actions. The question is, does this principle itself impose itself as a constraint on moral judgment and what is acceptable? One must know that in practice, no two cases are alike, and even if they were, they would be numerically different because it would be two events. Numerical differences are more easy to rule out because let's take for example the saying that something that is wrong for you might be wrong for me. This only makes sense because there is a qualitative difference between us two, not merely just because you are you and I am me. Moral judgments can contain proper names and be universalizable by replacing singular terms with general descriptions of persons and their relations and apply consistent judgments on things with that description. This is first order universability. It is often said that if we say any genuinely universalable prescription is moral, we must commit ourselves to endorsing all maxims that pass the test. This is only the case if we confuse moral as a descriptive term with its use to mean morally good. It's possible to recognize something as morality, to do so without any inconsistency to degree, radically with one's first order judgment statements. It's specialty words. Universality isn't a logical thesis as the consequence of both a descriptive and prescriptive moral terms. Even if it were a logical thesis, the action that the idea that actions are to be guided by maxim passing judgment is a substantive, practive principle, which demands for a certain sort of fairness. Another way to decide if a maxim is universalable is to simply try to put yourself in another person's shoes and see if his behavior is something you'd guide yourself by. This is a second stage of universalization. It's about prescriptive axioms that apply to all persons and to situations. The second stage, while a logical thesis also has moral terms whom judgments on them would require a substantive practical principle that actions guided by maxims will pass the test. The logical thesis has no bearing on the subsidium principle, as you can reject the subsidiums irregardless of the truth of the logical. Third stage is taking an extension of the second, which requires something requires someone to take into account different tastes. A problem with a view like John Rawls' theory of justice and fairness is that it doesn't take into account the idea that we as rational agents could work behind a veil of ignorance to principles that would be applied to situations irregardless of how an actual situation played out. Even if the choice resulted in more people being happy with a few suffering, it would be a gamble of ignorance. More quantitative theories of unitarianism make similar concession as as it allows the happiness of others to outweigh the undeserved suffering of others. This third, th stage, this third stage logical thesis would be wrong as we aren't constrained to give equal weight to all ideas. Objective values would also go against it as having objective validity of one's ideals gives a strong reason not to adopt others. Mixed up, I believe that we should distinguish between morality and rationality. Some moral actions could be always be rational, however it wouldn't follow 
follow automatically the rational action to do so was moral. There can be actions that are moral to do but not rational and vice versa. To show this, let's look at the ambiguity between moral rightness and moral permissibility. N number one, every rational permissible act isn't morally obligatory as you could just have a rational indifference to something. Two, every rationally obligatory act isn't morally obligatory as you could be compelled to do something because of X and find out you couldn't do it and you wouldn't be obligated to do another action just because of lack of being able to do the thing. Three, every rationally obligatory act doesn't have to be morally permissible as you can be both rational and immoral at the same time. Joel Marx gives an example of this by using an analogy of a burglar having to choose between keeping the money he stole or saving the life of a drowning boy. It would seem morally impermissible to let the boy drown while also seeming irrational to save him. What the burglar would be doing by saving the boy is listening to his conscience but not by his reason. For every rationally permissible act doesn't have to be morally permissible for the same reason as three aka that you can be rational and immoral at the same time. Five, every morally permissible act isn't rationally obligatory as you can do something on an irrational whim without doing anything morally prohibited. 6. Every morally permissible act isn't rationally permissible as you could do something against your best interest while not doing anything morally forbidden by it. 7. Every morally obligatory act isn't rationally permissible. Like with the drowning boy example, it shows how not to save the boy can be rationally obligatory while not being morally impermissible. 8. Every moral obligatory act isn't rationally obligatory by the same drowning boy example as something like rescuing the boy can be morally obligatory even though it would be rationally and impermissible. Overall, there is this case. The first stage rules out numerical differences between individuals. The second stage rules out generic differences where one is tempted to regard only one's particular qualities or conditions. And the third stage rules out differences to particular taste. You can only get to utilitarianism by accepting all three stages, but I've shown that it is easier said than done. A novelist like myself may take morality as an institution question. We can't endorse a prescription that resists first stage universalization, but it doesn't give us universalable maxims superiority to non-universalable ones. Well, that is all for today. This is Mr. Brass saying goodbye and get wise.